That's it. That's it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that and then switch it when, once we're up there. The chat is is beginning. It's already underway. I see a lot of chatting going on out there. So we're going to begin chatting up here, and then hopefully you'll find it interesting and come join us. So um, thank you all. I hope you found the lunch uh, refreshing. I, I sure did. They've been doing a great job with the food here. And uh, we really appreciate all the support from the campus. And um, so I thought the last two panels, and in, including our morning speaker, are a great setup for where we are now, which is beginning to have a chat. We did have the fireside log burning, but I, there it is. There's the, let's, let's keep the log burning. And um, so now we're really having a fireside chat. And I'm um, uh, just lucky to have these two education leaders and strategic thinkers on the stage here with me. Perhaps um, just to set the, set the tone, you could each give an introduction of yourselves and your current roles in the work that you're doing. But, um, I was hoping that I didn't have to introduce Larry, and Larry would have to introduce me, so I'm okay introducing <laughs> myself, I think. Um, and this is a carbon-neutral fireside chat, right? We're not, we're not sending additional carbon into the air with this one, so that's good. Yeah, um, my name's Tom Horvath. I am the uh, interim dean in the College of Science here at CSUMB. I've been here for five years um, at, the, at the campus. And um, prior to coming here, I was at a, u at a university in southwest Germany, also in this type of role, um, providing administrative support, ideas, strategic planning for, um, for a, a, an environmental science and natural sciences faculty there at an at a R1 institution. And prior to that, did all my professoring in freshwater ecology at one of the State University of New York campuses. Um, Larry Samuels, I know many of the people in this room from having worked here, but I'm working currently at UC Santa Cruz where I'm special advisor to the chancellor. Um, essentially the same role that I had here, um, growing UCSC, bringing um, R1 research into Monterey County and building relationships with the ag community, um, 
and the advanced air mobility community, um, which is near and dear to my heart in both cases. Yeah, thank you uh, for that. And Larry, I know you, I've known both of you now for a num quite a number of years, uh, but, but Larry, especially with the work that we both were involved in while I was at the Fort Ord Reeves Authority, and I know that you've, your uh, fingerprints are on a number of strategic uh, regional development uh, ideas that have become reality. So I think it's worth noting and just acknowledging that, that uh, you, you, know, you have a long and dedicated uh, level of engagement and influence on, on where things uh, might be going. And, and so I, I appreciate your strategic uh, thinking. And I think it's an appropriate uh, place to have you on this panel. Um, and Thomas, of course, you and I both uh, crossed paths first when I was probably um, coming around the campus looking for support for our first DART symposium. I think you were working with Andrew Lawson at the time. And the first DART symposium was held in 2019. We held that down at a hotel by the Naval Postgraduate School. And one of the things that happened at that, you know, they, when you talk about putting on a conference like this, people say, well, you gotta have some announcements to, to really get people's attention. And one of the things that was announced at that um, first symposium was the CSU's intention to create an engineering program here. And so, um, I think in line with the subjects that we've been talking about today, um, perhaps you could give a bit of an update on that, uh, where, where that's at, and, and um, you know, I, I know that while, while here, Larry, you also had, had some hand in architecting that, uh, the, in the program coming into fruition, so perhaps you could both comment on, on where that has come from, where it is now, and, and what it looks like in the months and years ahead. Uh, so yeah, so uh, reiterate that my background is as a freshwater ecologist, <laughs> and a few years ago, um, Andrew Lawson, the then dean, uh, he, he said, we need to create a, a, an engineering program. And I said, okay, well, you know, I, I grew up close to Purdue University, I know what engineering is. Um, have friends that are engineers, uh, but they started talking about mechatronics, and you know, I, my very first thing to do was Google what the hell is mechatronics, <laughs> all right? Um, figuring this out, and so now, now this really makes sense because look at the area that we're in. Um, we're not going to be able to to be to be competing with the with the Purdue's of the world in 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 mechanical engineering or electrical engineering, but we can we can be nimble enough at a at a mechatronics level to be competitive. And what's more exciting is to be um, quickly applicable to many of the situations, many of the problems that need to be solved in our area. And we had just started a, an agricultural plant and soil sciences program um, in 2020. And now we're looking at bringing in a, mecha uh, a mechatronics engineering program that is going to have, among its fo foci, it's going to have a focus on ag tech for sure. Um, so that makes sense. And, and you know, seeing... Uh, equipment in the back of the room from FarmNG, those types of, of platforms. We want to have students designing those, using those, putting them into farm fields nearby, or you know, we get a farm field here on on campus that we can test this, these types of platforms out in, and and really be the one of the driving forces um, for for training students to be productive in this new ag tech field that, that's coming online here. Right, we've got amazing partners at, at Hartnell and, and some of the other community colleges, Cabrillo and, and, and Monterey, Peninsula, Monterey Peninsula College. We've been working closely with them for the last two or three years to design a, a, a curriculum here in Mechatronics, a bachelor's degree, that will allow seamless transfer for the students at all three of those colleges who have an interest in engineering to then finish up their degree and, and you get their bachelors from, from uh, Monterey Bay. Um, and uh, proud to announce that we have hired our first engineer 
faculty member on this campus, Luis Cabrales, is standing in the back. You can wave, Luis. If you haven't had a chance to, to meet Luis, yeah, absolutely. If you haven't had a chance to talk with him, try to um, take a time on your way out today um, and say hello. Uh, but more exciting is that we're going to have our first cohort of students on this campus in uh, fall of 24, so that's next year. We will have engineer students at, at Cal State Monterey Bay. That's fantastic. Larry, do you want to add anything to that backstory or current story? Um, yeah, Bruce Taylor funded, nicely stepped up for 10 million several years ago. Um, Mechatronics was the clear choice. We wanted something to be, I'm going to be speaking in my old role here, so y'all have to just put up with that. Um, we wanted something that would be tractable from day one. Um, that would be easy for a comprehensive university like CSUMB to provide. Um, this region needs more research, but really what it needs is skilled um, engineering talent on a hands-on and application basis. And that's the notion of mechatronics. It's cross-disciplinary, um, real-world application of engineering skills from a number of domains. Um, and as a citizen of the region, I'm extraordinarily happy to see it be manifested finally and, and be able to start seeing the program take students and graduate students and really fulfill its role um, in helping the workforce here in the region. And in a number of the panels today, we've we heard about the importance and the value of industry partnerships in structuring these workforce training programs and input from community-based organizations. Um, can you talk a bit about how those two points of connection may be uh, having influenced the creation of this program or on the horizon to be included in the development of curriculum and programs that might be part of it? Yeah, I think, I think the, the, f the focus that we're going to have moving forward, right, so the, up until now it's really been getting through all of the administrative hoops of getting a program uh, uh, accepted through, through um, state, through regional accreditation, um, and now we're at the stage where we, we can really start thinking about who our, our industry partners are going to be. Um, we intend to be an ABED accredited program and that requires us to have an, uh, an industry advisory board and we'll be looking at Louise out there to try to make those connections um, with industry to, to get the expertise from the industry to let us know what skills the students are going to need to be employable in, in the region um, and, and even beyond. Uh, so we'll be, we'll be definitely looking for, for folks out there that have those, uh, that have that desire, as we heard from, from Daniel earlier today, about giving back to the community or, or you know, being there for the community um, so that we can, we can plug into the needs easily. And the other side of it with the curriculum is that we know that hands-on is gonna be important. So every student will be required to go through some sort of internship our goal is to have a paid, you know, have, have students in paid internship in local industry so that they're getting the skills, including the soft skills that they'll need to be, uh, to be successful once they leave uh, CS, uh, Cal State Monterey Bay. So our focus right now in this region in workforce training is, is probably localized on supporting both ag tech and the advanced air mobility movement. Um, we have applied in conjunction with CSUMB, all the community colleges within the region, um, all the metropolitan players in the region, the county um, politicos, even state politicos, and K-12 education, um, and folks like the Harris and Acción and Saidi, in putting together a grant application to the EDA um, in buying for what's called Tech Hub designation. So this is a program that the Economic Development Administration came up with trying to find small metropolitan service areas that have strategically important technology. Um, in our case, we used Salinas as the locus of what we were doing and tried to map 30 to 35 mile radius around Salinas, saying that brought in WISC at Hollister Airport, that brought in Archer. Um, at um, Salinas, 
that brought in Joby and Marina, um, and it also brought in Zero Avia, which is a leading hydrogen aircraft uh, player, um, also working out of Hollister Airport. The intent was to try to build this consortium of um, manufacturers, community organizations, municipalities, counties, um, and educational institutions to create a compelling argument for having the federal government give us 60 to $75 million to build a workforce training center at UC MBEST. And for those of you who know the, know the history of UC MBEST, with the dissolution of Fort Ord, um, both the CSUMB campus was created and a large parcel of land was given to UC Santa Cruz, um, about three miles from where we're sitting right now, um, along with an initial footprint of a building. And I'm sad to say, as a citizen, nothing's happened in 25 plus years there. So the Workforce Training Center is, is an attempt to start that, but there's also now a move to start building a hydrogen hub there, hydrogen storage and hydrogen research that nicely aligns with the news today that the state of California, the Arches Consortium in the state of California, a large portion of which is embedded within the UC system, um, has been designated one of the seven regional hubs and will be awarded $1.2 billion for hydrogen-based research into fuels and the like. Um, and that's an important part of the equation when we're talking about advanced air mobility, because if you know what's happening behind the scenes, hydrogen is a big part of the conversation kind of across the board. Um, so we're looking at UC AMBEST and the consortium of talent in terms of organizations, community-based organizations, universities, community colleges, um, corporations, and politicos to try to make sure that we get, the, if we don't get the federal funding to go to the state and ask for it, we have a very unique consortium that we put a lot of energy into over the last 90 days. Um, and the application's quite strong. When Gavin Newsom was here in July, the one thing he walked away saying was workforce training. And I think that there's a very wide open uh, door in Sacramento for us to bring this kind of a template to him and say fund it. Well, that just covered my last three bullet points of key topical questions, but I'm glad you did all that because I think it, it actually illustrates um, a number of strategic uh, activities that are underway that will contribute momentum to, you know, realizing some of the things that, that we've been talking about being a need here and that uh, I think will add vitality to our whole ecosystem that we're trying to bring into life here. So perhaps then um, looking into your strategic kind of uh, thinking hat and, and uh, what perhaps is missing in the regional partnership matrix that we currently have or where do you see opportunities for us to uh, continue to improve and refine what we have underway already? The answer to that is this community is small enough, this region is small enough that we have to work together. Fundamentally, the partnerships that have been created in looking at trying to retain Joby manufacturing in the region <clears throat> and trying to put together um, this grant application, there's a very, very effective coalition of community-based organizations, um, higher education, K-12 education, and in fact, corporate interests that are supporting that. Um, it's very unique, but the one thing that's real is this is not a large enough region to take that kind of uh, collaboration frivolously. It's, it's a very serious game that we're playing, and we're playing against very large and organized uh, efforts, and I think the best example of that is the Joby manufacturing selection process where you have states that have decades of economic contraction that have tried to figure out how do we become a player, and so they've created taxation mechanisms and funding mechanisms that far surpass anything that the state of California can do, let alone our little region of the Monterey Bay area. So with collaboration, with a unified voice of going to 
federal government or state government entities continuing to look for grant funding opportunities, um, looking at the industry that we have as a diversified set of interests, including something like hydrogen, um, we have the opportunity to, with the Unified Voice, bring in both funding dollars and state dollars um, to be able to provide not only the kind of transfer pathways that are critical, you know, the, the both K-12 to higher ed, community college to higher ed, um, and even in, interinstitutional, right? There's, there's a transfer pathway that takes place from CSUMB to come to uh, UCSC because we are offering um, you know, doctoral degrees and that's something right now that the CSU system does not for the most part grant. Um, and I, I can't emphasize, as a person who's lived in this region since the late 70s um, and who has spent a ton of energy, we were sitting on this stage 10 years ago, Josh, um, talking about economic development, talking about regional expansion, talking about job creation, talking about educational integration. And we've made huge strides since then. But the next generation of strides that have to be taken are really around job creation. And that's going to necessitate a lot of cooperation and focusing on, on and you've heard this several times today and over the last couple of days, workforce training in a focused way. And it cannot be one institution. Um, no one institution can do this. It has to be a collaborative effort. And I think one of the strengths that we have in this area that positions us well for a lot of this job force development, workforce development conversation and going after these large grants and why we're successful for the, for the most part getting them, um, just simply look at what we've done with, with the USDA Next Gen that you heard about earlier. Um, 20, 20 million dollars between U, um, UC Santa Cruz, Cal State Monterey Bay and Hartnell and on top of that another 10 million from the uh, Cal State Systems Agricultural Research Institution. 30 million dollars sitting in just in this area in student scholarships to get students into the classrooms to get them the training in ag, ag tech and other areas related um, and, and out in the workforce. And what's really what's really fantastic about this area, I've never seen it in any other area in higher education is how well we work together. We work so tightly with, with the community colleges, with um, UCSC, I mean, we have, we have postdocs that are coming down and teaching some of our classes in areas that we can't hire faculty to teach, right? So giving them the opportunity to come down and get the, the experience teaching. Our students see what a, what a PhD student can do. Um, they strive for that in the next step. So we're moving students up to them. They're bringing some of their expertise down to us. We're doing the same thing at Hartnell. We're gonna, you know, when we created the Ag Plant and Soil Sciences program here, we relied heavily with, uh, on the expertise that's at Hartnell. We don't have a tractor on campus. Uh, we can't teach students how to drive a tractor, but they can do that. They can teach them how to weld. We can give them the plant pathology and, and make a, an incredibly well-rounded student that then has the skills, the, the hands-on skills necessary to get jobs in the area and be super productive and, and you know, contribute to this you know, multi-billion dollar industry that we have just in Salinas Valley alone. I'm gonna add a plug for heart now. I mean, when, you, when you're in this region long enough, you get a sense for institutions, right? So we have Cal Poly to the south, and you know, now that's a pretty elite university. You want your kid to go to a school in the state of California in the public side, that's the third most selective um, institution in the state, more selective than Santa Barbara, more selective than San Diego, more selective than Davis, only Berkeley and UCLA are more selective. To the north, we've got UC Davis, um, the preeminent ag school probably in the country, um, highly selective and, you know, relatively, I think in the pantheon of, of this, of Salinas Valley, um, the primary influencer. But amidst this all, and you've got a 25, 50-year-old uh, university plus in Santa Cruz, a 25-year-old here at CSUMB, and a 100-plus-year-old institution called Hartnell, which has created so much goodwill, such a strong educational machine, um, that in terms of partnership, you know, entities like UC a &R that's looking at a, a brand new food safety um, standing up a USDA-affiliated food safety branch for 
multi-institutional cooperation and research is of course bringing in Hartnell to the story because they're a necessary part of the equation. So it, it's a fascinating thing from what we call an R1, which is an elite research university, or from a comprehensive university's perspective, to have such a robust partner. And I'm not at all impugning Cabrillo or MPC, but you know, Cabrillo was founded in 1959, I think MPC a few years before that. Nothing compares to what our friends in Salinas have been doing for the last 100 plus years. <laughs> yeah, well, um, yeah, I think there's a solid foundation there. And uh, my other question here about intercampus coordination has just been well, well touched. So um, I, I think there is another strategic kind of planning activity that's underway around the state and many of us are involved in, um, including many of our community-based partners who have been, at least in my work in the last year, kind of the, the big uh, kind of new, I, new set of powerful relationships that we have built that I think have just a tremendous growth potential to continue to, to, to bring to bear on all of that we're working on is this Community Economic Resilience Fund planning activity that's happening throughout California and here, here in uh, our region as well. So, um, you know, that as well as being a planning activity to bring new people into this kind of long-term strategic planning realm of economic development is also a specific opportunity to interject key uh, enabling projects that we may, um, that the community may think is important to, to fund and support. Um, we're part of our thinking on the completion of this workforce training center feasibility study, for example, is an idea that if there is an, ag an agreement, a consensus on the need for that, that that could potentially bubble up as something that, that comes up in this uh, in these planning tables that that are formed out there. So, Larry, are you're involved in the SURF program? Can you give a little bit of insight into how that's unfolding? Now, I'm supposed to know the name of the new entity. Yesterday, SURF was renamed, and I'm going to just the economic development something like fund. California Jobs First. Okay. Isn't Somewhere in that space, because um, I got on a phone call home on the way home yesterday. Um, the, the SURF project is still relatively nascent in terms of um, what it's doing. It's funding some specific proposals right now, um, there, and there are parallel tracks. There's also a K-16 um, educational initiative through SURF that is, um, that is proceeding and is actually in advance of the general SURF work. Um, in our region, it's a six-county coalition um, spanning from Ventura County all the way to Santa Cruz County, so it's relatively large. Um, but the idea is to look for fundable projects that really generate real jobs for Californians. Um, and right now, each region is kind of in the evaluation process. There have been some proposals floated. Um, a lot of that selection is going to take place over the next six months. And it's going to involve steering committees and complete grassroots um, input and organization. So I think, you know, I'm looking at, and I see several of my fellow uh, SURF members here. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're doing our best to try to advance this in a way that is equitable because that's the foundation of the SURF program, that it really looks out and um, looks at job creation for everybody and does not necessarily discriminate amongst um, those, those endeavors that would require, for example, an advanced degree. Instead, it looks and says, we need to fundamentally create living wage jobs in this state, and there are a ton of opportunities to do that, so let's responsibly try to include everybody and do it. Nothing, okay. Yeah, so... Um I think it's an ambitious program, and I really look forward to seeing how it yields 
uh, what, what are the projects that bubble up uh, to, to be of importance? And, and um, I think that the work that we have been able to undertake over the last year in this, in this project specifically, I hope, creates a sense of awareness of the opportunity here that will, and a sense of ownership in some, some ways, because the more that I've been uh, talking about the, the work that we're doing, especially as our relationships with the CITE cohort and the Monterey County Black Caucus and others grow, is that, you know, we're really um, kind of reflecting and amplifying the work that everybody else is doing and, and just serving a convening function to um, try to, you know, support uh, those communities uh, becoming, you know, an empowered and influential part of this decision making. And so I think that's just kind of a, you know, it's a unique experience um, to have, and it's, I, I'm, I feel lucky to have, have that opportunity. I know that there's three white guys up here talking to a crowd, but we had yesterday. With brown, with brown shoes, yo. With brown shoes, we're, we're, but we're we are talking had, about the last panel. <laughs> we had three folks up here with dark trousers and brown shoes. I thought that would not have happened 30 years ago. So. But I will say we're also, we, as I've mentioned before, we're, we're responding in a very nimble way to the tides of the world that's going around, and we're here because our intended keynote speaker was departed to other parts of the world. So, um, but I think, nevertheless, the, 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 the three of us have been, in, in a large part, involved in a number of strategic things that um, you know, we're just able at least to, to kind of champion those who we're um, working closely with and hopefully contribute these um, you know, ideas and insights that, that we've been able to participate in and help, help grow. So that's a, just a bit of a statement on uh, where that's coming from. I mean, the thing that I would emphasize again, is this is we're a small enough region that without deep interinstitutional cooperation and support from the businesses, um, whatever they may be, ag, you know, advanced air mobility, tourism, um, really try to understand that if we work collaboratively together, we can transform um, the face of particularly Monterey County, but certainly the greater Monterey Bay region. And you know, that, that level of interinstitutional cooperation you're starting to see in the articulation of transfer pathways between the community colleges and CSUMB. Um, that same effort is starting up at UCSC, transfer pathways, and articulating very clearly two plus two degrees so that students walking in the door can see on day one, you know, I'm going to be a CSUMB student in two years. I'm going to be a UCSC student in two years. Um, that kind of of cooperation, handoff, and articulation work. This is actually a lot of work for institutions to sit down and agree on what kind of courses and what kind of an, uh, uh, course work will allow a student to be successful. And yet, every one of these institutions is engaged in a cooperative fashion towards that end. And I think that's something that Tom can speak to specifically. Absolutely, and it's not just inter-institutional um, cooperation, it's intra institutional cooperation. I'm looking at Brad there who, who called out Mechatronics earlier this morning. It's my chance to call out the supply chain management program that is going to contribute to, to a lot of this as well. Mechatronics 24, supply chain management 25, right? So and we're always thinking about where we can contribute to the local economy, where we can partner with industry, where we can partner with each other for the, the greater economic good of the area. Well, I will say I noticed your science speak there with the inter and the intra. That would be part of your aquatic ecology educational background, I presume. And uh, just a note, um, I'm a guy in a suit here, or a suit coat, but uh, in my early career, my undergraduate degree was in environmental biology with a, uh, with a uh, minor in freshwater ecology. So I can relate to your aquatic ecology background and look how things evolve. 
Let's just say that. <laughs> I dropped out of high school. I, I, I knew I liked Josh. I knew I liked Josh for a reason. Now I, now I know why. And uh, before we wrap up this nice fireside chat, or at least if there's any questions, we can take some. I would like to give a shout out to uh, a man who became a mentor for me and had a strong influence here on what has happened at the former Ford Ord, Mr. Michael Hulamar Jr. And the reason I'm doing that is that he, um, he was the executive uh, officer for the Fort Ord Reuse Authority, which was a special district here overseeing the redevelopment of Fort Ord for about 20 years. And um, when I had the opportunity 10 years ago to begin to work with this group, it was about 14 people, it was probably the most diverse place I had ever worked before. And um, it was amazing how this group of people was able to accomplish so much. And I'm looking over here at Rosalind Green. She was part of that team and some of the others here, Jen Simon um, and others. And we, um, you know, it was just incredible uh, what we did. And it was his leadership. He would manage these meetings of, of you know, 25 super, you know, the, the leaders of agencies and uh, elected officials for this region, which are notoriously at one another's business. And he did it with deft and poise and just showed me uh, a great way to, to operate. So I, I just want to acknowledge Michael Hulamard. He's not here today. He's, he's still with us, of course, but I, I want to uh, call that out. So he um, taught us how to survive four or five hour meetings. <laughs> Among other things, he said, cool heads prevail. So, um, yeah, I appreciate you both taking the time to sit down and have this conversation. If there's anyone that has a question or a comment, there's, I see one hand raised. We can take that before the next group comes up. Matthew. No, uh, for the simple reason it's hard enough to do this, um, and we're not done. So the other answer would be, you know, we have significant work to sustain our coalition and build this. At the point, you know, the replication comes from success. Prior to, you know, demonstrating success, um, you best keep your mouth tightly closed because, you know, the old walk and talk, you know, saying comes into play here. We, we, we would prefer, I think as a region, because we're small, because we have this proximity to Silicon Valley, so we have access to some very interesting ideas and talent and money, um, but, you know, it's getting it done. And in the same way as, the, you know, the, the Monterey Bay College Pathways Partnership here at CSUMB, um, you know, is known in this region. When it gets done, it will be the first time it's ever happened in the state of California, and that will be significant. Um, but until it's done, it's talk. You gotta be real careful, too much talk doesn't really get you there. So yeah, we're open to sharing, but I think we need to execute here. And that's the beauty of having three different people on stage. You can have three different answers to the same question. Not to go too hard against it, but I can tell you that uh, we, within the DART organization, have actually established good working relationships with other parts of the state who are interested in what is happening here and are seeing, even though we may not be able to plant a flag on the hills of Iwo Jima and say this is one, we can say that there is incremental progress being made and value creation. So I think, Matthew, to your question, um, yeah, w you know, uh, we have established through the Irvine connection, a um, relationship with the group in Stockton called the Edge Collaborative. They're uh, uh, now a kind of formal partner. We've established this MOU strategy that we're working with multiple entities to just find ways to clarify how we're working together through this, this nonprofit structure. And, you know, admittedly, the institutions of the universities and the formalization of curriculums and all of that are much more 
rigorous and standard, standardized and, and necessarily bureaucratic. So that's one of the benefits of, I think, having a nonprofit structure is you can kind of, you know, be a little more nimble on that front. And um, a lot of, you know, I, I see Chris Bly in the background, or in the back seat, he likes to hang in the back, but uh, if you all saw Chris's travel schedule this summer, um, he's been all over the country multiple times uh, at relevant kind of professional meetings, kind of building relationships that, you know, many of those have brought people here today. And it's just another example of that, uh, you know, we, we love, that's kind of the part that, that I, I love is, you know, kind of going around and, and making these connections. So, so we're going to continue to do that. And then also work, you know, Larry is very, uh, you know, place-based and, and set, you know, centered here, which is critical. And we're going to bring those those items back for the benefit of the region as as it's uh, relevant. And it is difficult to scale up, right? This type of, of comprehensive public-private cooperation is very, very difficult to scale up. But at small things, we can do that. So you, we look at what we've done with a computer science in three-year program, a CS in three with Hartnell, and replicated that downstate. And now we've taken it to the state level in the Computer Talent Initiative, which is really building pipeline for, for a diverse workforce in computer science in the area. Those are, there are successes, that, that and, but they do take an enormous amount of work and many, many, many years of, of dedicated, focused work. Yeah, I mean, the relationships are key. That's what's key. And so uh, spending time together is, I think, a great step to take towards, you know, expanding this influence. So, um, Andrea, are you standing here for a reason? On um, success stories, I just heard about this last week at a conference, so I wanted to share because I think it's really interesting. Um, Intel put out um, a manufacturing center RFP, and the state of Ohio, Ohio's just winning it lately, um, <laughs> 80 institutions, educational institutions across the state of Ohio came together to put together one proposal for a manufacturing site that they will all collaborate on. So I have definitely not dove into what they proposed and how they did it, but certainly it requires a sincere you know, commitment to the partnership, but not just on the educational institutions, but obviously the state. The state was involved in getting, getting those folks to the table together. And anyway, just wanted to share that, thought maybe some of you would find that interesting. Thanks. So I, I'd like to touch that at least. Um, right. We lost Joe B. manufacturing jobs to Ohio. Ohio has had an incredible contraction in manufacturing jobs for 40 plus years. Um, around 10 years ago, 15 years ago, they decided to change that. So they sidetracked taxation revenues. They built up a large fund they organized kind of across the state um, a readiness campaign so that, and it's more than just the dollars. Joby had more money offered by other states than Ohio, but Ohio put together a comprehensive campaign that talked about co collaboration and cooperation between higher education institutions, workforce entities, um, tax breaks, and you know, that, that as a state you know, as a region, we need to do that as much as we can, but there are limits as to what we can do. As a state, I think I mentioned this on, on Monday, that's one place that our state, rep our elected representatives need to start facing that there are a number of new manufacturing type jobs in clean industries and sustainable sectors that we want to keep here, but in order to be competitive, we have to up our games substantially. So. Those of you that know Governor Newsom or whoever else, please, Jackie. Thank you, Larry. So in terms of um, organizing that campaign, you know, they, we found that some entities like the California Economic Summit. Like, what kind of statewide entity did they become for organizing that? So California Forward certainly, I mean, frustrating this week that we had actually both conferences running, so we have folks down uh, California Forward um, and folks here. Um, 
yes, California Forward is an entity, but really what this is going to take at some level is our elected representatives and Governor Newsom um, deciding that the loss of those type of jobs, you have to draw the line somewhere, right? What, what kind of jobs do we want to keep? Well, sustainable green manufacturing jobs that create living wage for everyone affiliated with them are the kind of jobs that we want in this state. So walking those kind of opportunities um, really is a statewide effort. And much in the same way, Andre alluded to what Ohio has done it. We have to do that. We can start that here regionally within our region, but the meta ask and the, and the real um, retention efforts or attraction efforts, like in the case of Intel, right, are going to take statewide collaboration. Yeah, yeah, and I totally concur with that, as you would imagine, and uh, more to come on that, but I think that is one of the things that we can push up on. And also, I know that there, there will be one member of the California um, Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development on this next panel. So maybe that's a topic that Tony Gomez can address a little bit. So thank you all for listening to our fireside chat, and I look forward to bringing on this uh, next panel. Thank you both. Thank you.